Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you might be around the world. Thank you for joining today's Ask a Professional Scrum Trainer with uh, Jeff Bullballs. And uh, th thank you for joining me today, Jeff. My name is Eric Neighberg. Oh, sorry. My name is Eric Neighberg, and I'll be your host today. I run uh, marketing and operations here at scrum.org. So let's get started. Next slide. So just some quick guidelines. Your microphones will be muted throughout, but please ask questions. Uh, you can see here in the box how to ask those questions. Just uh, go into your your go to webinar browser and you'll see a drop down for questions. Type away and we'll take as many as we can throughout the day. Next slide. So just briefly, for those of you new to this event or new to scrum.org, who is scrum.org? Scrum.org is founded by Ken Schwaber, the co-creator of Scrum, and uh, he continues as our chairman. Uh, Ken has built an organization that's really focused on consistency, uh, consistent training, consistent vocabulary, and, and really con consistent learning um, around the world. Um, we provide things, thought leadership, like this webinar, uh, like the Scrum Guide and lots of other materials. We provide uh, training. Um, and consistent training around the world with about 340 trainers all over the globe teaching the same content and same materials, folks like Jeff. Um, certification, we've got over 430,000 people certified on Scrum. Again, focused and very focused on, on Scrum and agility. And then ongoing learning. Your learning doesn't stop after, after you're uh, done with a training class or taking a certification. And we provide learning paths and lots of free resources to help you keep learning and keep moving forward. So next slide. With that, I will hand it over to Jeff and Jeff will uh, take you through this. Jeff, all yours. Sure, so I'll just give a little background on myself. So uh, like Eric said, I'm a professional Scrum trainer with scrum.org. Um, I've been a developer, I've been a product owner, I've been a Scrum master. Um, and now I focus more on organizational agility. Uh, also run a podcast called Agile Wire, um, but really love working with organizations to unlock um, organizational agility and Scrum's a big part of that. So I'm uh, excited to uh, answer all your um, Scrum related questions today. So let's kick it off. Eric, do you get that first question lined up for us? I do. and. Uh... They're coming in as I speak as well and keep them coming in. So first question, um, could you please discuss the burn down process? Who's responsible for various components and tracking? Uh, I'm not sure what the correct, correct way is to answer um, it, or to understand really burn downs, but I read a lot about it. I, I see a lot about it and uh, would love to understand a little bit more about what are we talking about here? Sure. So I've got a whiteboard up here that I'm just going to use a virtual whiteboard. So I'm going to draw a little picture of a burn down. So for those who don't know, usually you see this in most of the tools. It's got a, this line and it's like this perfect scenario. Of like if the work got done at this consistent pace, this is what it would look like. So as we do sprint planning, there's hours that are over here on the side. And usually that gets tasked up to a certain level. And it's, you know, let's just say there's 100 hours of work and it tracks down. Well, what we end up doing is we track, well, how much work is actually getting done and when is it getting done? And it will go up and down and, you know, something like this because work will get added, tasks will get added throughout. And this is just a complementary practice that can be used with Scrum to manage the progress. And so the developers on the team, um, so those people that are doing the work, uh, they, they need to monitor the progress of where they're going and, and be able to adapt their plan. And so this is a tool that they can use. There's many tools that you can use. There's many different ways to do this. But the goal is to say, oh, we added work here. We're behind schedule. Is there something we need to do? Do we need to go and talk to the product owner? Maybe we need to renegotiate scope. Maybe we need to remove a product backlog item so we can live the value of focus and, uh, and, and actually get to a done increment. It's something that doesn't support maybe the sprint goal. So that's what you use the burn down for. You could use other things. So I'll give you a couple examples of um, teams that I've worked with and what we've done. So there was one team where they they were all in person. They had like this team room, and this is back pre-COVID days. And in sprint planning, they would put everything on a physical board and they'd have tasks with their stickies on them. And they would take those tasks in and put them on like an architectural diagram. And they'd say, oh, 
these two tasks are going to hit the same service and we were both going to do it in the second quarter of the sprint being you know the net, you know after the first two and a half days somewhere in that next two and a half to five days you know we were going to hit that and so we both can't be in that same code at the same time maybe we should change the way the way we do these pbis and still hit the sprint goal how do we do that and so they come up with a new plan and they would kind of just mark quarter one two three or four and then they would look back at their board and let's just say we were five days into a two-week sprint and they would say oh well all of our quarter two ones should be done are they and they look at it and they say no well, do we need to make any changes or yes? And uh, we're ahead of schedule. We should start thinking about what we might want to pull at the end of the sprint if we're going to do that, or is there some technical debt we could do, or what what do we what changes do we need to make? So it helped the team to expand or explore what they needed to do and kind of know where they were. So that's one way to do it. Um, there's also teams instead of using this, another common thing is that it track a work in progress age. And so this could be very simple as just adding tallies on your tasks or your product backlog items and saying hey, this thing's getting old. It's been out here for a long time. What, what's going on? And uh, you can look at that compared to other stuff. And then it helps the team to know, hey, we need to rally around this task or this product backlog item to help meet the sprint goal uh, before it gets to be too late. So they all accomplish the same goal, but the why is really to give us transparency and visibility and, to our, and track our progress towards the sprint goal. Awesome, thanks, Jeff. Yep. Um, so we have a, another question from Dominica. Um, when multiple teams are working on the same project together, how many product backlogs and product owners should we have? Um, now, I, I guess there's probably two ways to ask this question, project versus product, and I'm sure you'll uh, mm -hmm. you'll take that on a little bit. Thanks, Jeff. Yep, so I'll, I'll just talk first about some just basic fundamentals for scaling. So when we say, you know, scaling Scrum, there's some things that we believe. Well, we, if we have one product, well, you're seeing a project, but usually a project, there's multiple projects in a product. So if we have one product, we should have one product backlog. If we have one product backlog and one product, we should have one product owner. We should have one to many development teams. Or really scrum teams right it could be it could be either or and then um, we need one dod or definition of done and one increment oops i'm totally not zoomed into the right area where here where i'm drawing here so i'm doing this on two screens all right so those are kind of some foundations to scaling when we're thinking about what we want to have so you said you had multiple projects I would say, well, what is what is the product? What do we actually sell? Um, and is that really one product? Because if it's in that case, then it should look something more like this, where we'd have one product owner, one backlog, and then one to many development teams underneath this. What often happens though, this is you know what happens when we when we're when I walk into organizations is they do something a little different a common pattern that I see is you have a product owner they put a, a team backlog out there and then they put a team underneath that a product owner a team a team backlog and then a you know another team and they just kind of keep doing this in a lot of organizations and maybe this leads to some resource allocation issues because we have people going across these teams maybe there's dependencies across these teams and so what a lot of organizations do is they say, well, we need somebody else, you know, um, up at this level to be a product owner. And these teams can report to them and they can help manage those dependencies. And then we maybe need another person. And maybe we need some people with technical knowledge up in this other area. And what ends up happening is people end up scaling demand, the demand of the work. They just add more and more things to a list instead of over here where we scale delivery. So when you're scaling, think about scaling delivery, not demand. And how can you remove dependencies instead of um, create them across your teams? And, and I'm going to kind of just talk about a couple key things when you're thinking about your product and what is your product. Because I think this is the baseline where a lot of teams kind of get, they struggle. And they, they wonder why certain events in Scrum don't quite make sense. Or why people don't want to come to their sprint review. Or 
you know, why does no one seem to care about what we're actually making? And a lot of times it's because they're over here and they're just a component team. You know, they might have these teams aligned around maybe databases or services or UX or, you know, um, you know, Salesforce, you know, something like that. They're relying around technologies or, you know, maybe they're relying on systems. I see this in a lot of organizations. Like if we were an insurance company, maybe it's billing and claims and enrollment and web, right? And each of these are separate things, but you don't sell billing as an insurance company. You don't sell claims. You don't sell enrollment. You sell group insurance. You sell individual insurance. You sell some insurance product. And so what I would say is, can you create copy paste of each team? So you have each team is has all the skills needed to solve a business problem. So put stack and rack those business problems like we have over here in the skill delivery, and then have teams take those problems and execute on them. And I know that's simpler, easier said than done, but really what I'm saying is we have claim skill sets, billing skill sets, enrollment and web all on each one of these teams so they can take anything there and execute on that. This gives the organization a lot more res, um, resiliency, a lot more ability to respond to change. I mean, COVID happens and all of a sudden we're sitting here and and uh, if we were Microsoft and you had teams dedicated to you know Access, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, team you know teams and you know everything else if i already allocated that team there's no one that can i can't get a team that works on access to move to teams i'm kind of stuck and and i can only do so much right but if i can say oh wow everyone's going remote we need to build the infrastructure for teams we need to add this extra functionality i can line all my teams around that right now and we can solve different business problems within that problem space and so it gives your organization a lot more flexibility to do that so Eric, I feel like I've been talking a lot there. Is any follow-up questions to that um, before I decide where we need to dive deeper, if we do need to dive deeper on this there topic? Is. There's, there's there is. There's actually a follow-up. Yep, there's okay. actually a follow-up question directly to this one. Um, just want to... Uh-oh, I lost it. Um, so oh, there, there was a follow-up question to this is, does it even make sense to add additional teams? Or should we try to to handle things within a single team? It's a great question, right? Um, you know, nail it before you scale it, and what you know, don't if you the first rule of scaling is don't 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 scale. Like, um, so if you can do it with one team, do that. Um, even if you have to go a little bigger, my personal opinion and my preference, what I've seen is if you go even have to go a little bigger than the recommendation of nine people that are you know developers on your team um it's worth it if you have to go to 10 or 11 or 12 like maybe it's worth it if you don't have any dependencies and you don't have another team that might be a way thing to explore um but in some cases it makes sense to split the teams too it, it really depends on your context but yeah if you can do it in one team do it like every time you add another team even when our example up here where we've got the scaling delivery so if I add, if I just had that one team and I add a second team, I lose a little bit from that second team, a little bit from that first team. Like that, there is coordination cost for adding that second team to that first team. When I add that third team, that second team loses a little something, and that first team loses a little bit more, right? And then I and then I add a fourth team, and I've already started at this point, and then I got to lose a little bit from each of the teams again, and more coordination costs across all these teams. So at a certain point, there isn't ROI to add more teams, um, or there could be. We might need to split into smaller product areas um, that deliver value holistically as a as a product group, and that's a whole. I mean, we can talk about what that actually looks like, but that um, some context is helpful there to, to help align around that. Great, thanks, Jeff. And, and a somewhat related question: um, I work with an offshore QA team, and in, in it's a very limited team, and it's shared. Do you have suggestions on how to to work with a, a, a shared team that maybe I don't have all of the, uh, they're not all in our group and they may not even be all, all in our team. Any any thoughts there? Yeah, I, I guess the first thing is I'd go back to the team and say, you know, what's the way, what's the best way to resolve this issue? So first step, ask the team because they might have some really great ideas. Um, maybe you can get some of those skill sets on your team. Maybe the team can do something and then there's some validations or some automation that that team can do, you know, 
um, quicker or more real time, or maybe they don't need to do as much as they're doing right now. Um, but I would put it to the team to ask them, how do we resolve that problem? And I wouldn't be content with just managing the dependency. And so what a lot of teams will do is like, well, let's try to streamline how we communicate with them and you know, work on the flow of that QA team. But that's a localized problem. And I would focus more on the delivery of value and like, what do we need to do that and what's slowing us down? And so if you can focus, bring that back to the team and help them understand the constraints and the optimizing goal of delivering value to the organization, I bet you they'll help you figure out a good solution to that. Awesome, thanks, Jeff. I guess let's let's continue on this thread a little bit more, and then we'll change subjects. So, kind of following up on that, in in if there are adequate number of people um, to have a data person on every team, how should we handle that? And I think they may have answered the question in their question, but go for it. Yeah, do it. Put them on the team. So here's another thing you can do. I'll I'll just give this tool out there. So track your dependencies as a team to see if you need that skill set. So it can be something as simple as, um, hey, we're just gonna say every time we wait for another team, let's track that and how long we wait. And so if I've got a, a team here and they just create a simple chart and they say, okay, group A, you know, we we waited, oops, sorry, not quite aligned to my drawings here. Group A, um, you know, the first day of the sprint, we waited eight hours for them to get back to us and resolve a problem. You know, maybe it's a security problem, whatever. You know, whatever type. Then the next day we waited two hours for them. And then the next day we waited six hours for them to get back to us and resolve a problem. Then, you know, two days, you know, 16 hours. And we keep tracking that, but then we have this team B and it's just like one hour, two hours, and that was the whole entire sprint. And then we got team C where it's, you know, 24 hours, 16 hours, 24 hours, you know, 48 hours. I would look at these and I would say, well, C looks like there's long delays there. What can we do? Do we need that scale set? You know, um, B, A is also very, you know, we're having that pretty frequently, but they're much more responsive than C. B is pretty responsive, so I wouldn't worry about resolving that dependency maybe right away. I would focus my effort on A and C so that you can deliver value quicker and you're not sitting there waiting on, uh, for the delays in between that and probably C first. So maybe you can put some value behind that. I'll tell a quick story. Um, there was a team I walked into and there was this leader who wanted to be the product owner. And and he, I didn't think he was gonna have enough time. He had a lot on his plate. And um, so what we did is he he's just stopped coming to like events. There was no events. He would show up like every fourth sprint to a sprint review and be like, why are we going down this direction? And, uh, you know, totally pivot, make big changes. And so after this happened a couple of times, we said, okay, we're gonna turn, this is costing the organization a lot of money, let's track that. And so every time we made these changes, we tracked just like this, how many hours of effort it was costing to go and make this big pivot because the person wasn't there giving his feedback and being a part of it and setting the vision. And when we put a dollar amount to those hours, once we kind of knew what the team relatively cost, and it being like between 350 and $400,000 a year, and it was pretty easy to say, hey, we can get a product owner and save the company quite a bit of money if we can just have somebody focus that is a part of this team. So you can use that same argument here where it's like, hey, you know, look how much money this is actually costing this team in delay because we're waiting for them. Um, it's going to be cheaper for us to get the skill set on the team. What do we have to do to do that? And maybe it's hiring somebody. Maybe it's training. Um, it could be whatever, whatever need you need for your context. But I, again, whenever you can, bring it back to the team to say, this is a problem. What do you need to solve that problem? Get another Perfect. question here. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yep. The next question, uh, kind of let's change directions a little bit here. This is one that comes up quite often. Can you please if, if, uh, answer, so I'm, I'm reading verbatim, but let's not do that. Uh, yeah, if an urgent change request comes into the picture, in, that may affect, say, velocity, for example. Should we entertain it? Should we should we consider it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, the goal isn't to say we're gonna lock everything down. There's a cost to that. So I think you have to have a good conversation with the product owner, whoever's thinking about making that change of, hey, this thing was gonna cost you $5,000 to build if we wait till next sprint, but if we pull it in now and we put something else on hold, that thing becomes more expensive. 
And this thing that you're pulling in also becomes more expensive because we need to figure a lot of things out and we haven't had time to you know, work with the customers to really understand what they really want and their needs. And so is it worth that extra cost? So I think it's always a trade-off, like life's full of trade-offs. And so you are giving something up to pull that extra item in, but then you have to understand like, is the benefit there, is it worth it? So context matters, have the conversations. Um, but what doesn't work is you only have so much room in a sprint for stuff. So if you think of your sprint as a five gallon bucket and you filled it full with five gallons of water and you're gonna dump another gallon of water in it, something's overflowing. And you can either scoop out that gallon first and decide what's coming out, or you can just let everything kind of flow out and you're gonna get you're gonna get something maybe that's higher value flowing out that's just not gonna get done and not deliver value to your customers. So my recommendation would be make conscious choices when you're gonna do this and talk in the terms of trade-offs. Awesome, and I, I think one other thing in this is, and, and it, it's a hot button for me and, and it's something I kind of caught and jumped on is that word velocity. Velocity is mm -hmm. not what's important here, value is what's important. Um, is that gonna impact velocity? Maybe, is it gonna deliver more value? Maybe, and that's much more important. Exactly. Um, don't ever use velocity as, as a weapon. Don't use it as a way to compare teams. Use it as a way to predict and to forecast. And that's really what we're using velocity. There's lots of things that impact velocity. People on holidays, um, you know, national holidays, lo lots of things can impact that. But if yep. we've got an urgent request that comes in, now the, the important other piece to that is making sure that that urgent request is going through the product owner for prioritization and not going directly to say the development team, which often people will try to do. Right. So cool, thanks. Um, ne next question, what is management's role in Scrum? If the Scrum team's self-organizing, where does management come in? Yeah, there's, there's a big role for management. So management sets the guardrails for like self-organization. So self-organization, can go much more, it can go much further than just how we do the work and and who does the work. It can go into like, how do we select teams? So maybe I've just done this recently with a couple of teams and a couple of product areas where teams have self-selected into different teams and different product areas. And management sets the guardrails of, well, I need the teams to be this size. I need these skills on these teams. I need them to have X, Y, and Z. So they set all these guardrails up and then they might have, maybe they get somebody to help facilitate that. Or maybe they do coaching and mentoring. Or, you know, where do they need to be helping with hiring and, and uh, performance and things along those lines. So there's many things that managers do. They're not directing how the work gets done anymore, which is very different than what they probably are used to. Um, but they are guiding from a strategic standpoint, from an educational standpoint, from creating an environment and protecting a culture that allows for innovation and adaptability and responsiveness. So they have a, a, a big part in the organization. It's just their role does change um, from directing work to more of a supporting type role. Thanks, Jeff. So yeah. uh, next next question, I, I know you've got some experience in this, so I think it might be a good one. Can you describe some best ways to estimate hours and, and maybe even costs for a large project um, when there's lots of unknowns? And where is the Scrum framework used? This is exactly what Scrum's here for, but I'm sure you've yeah. got some examples where people are asking, well, we need some forecasts. How, how can we start to estimate that? Yeah, so if you are gonna forecast, use empirical data. Um, one, I'll, I'll give you this tool. If It's a Monte Carlo is what I use with Teams when I need to. But before I'll even show any kind of forecast of what we're gonna do, we need to prove that we can deliver something and we have to have some history of that. Generally, five to seven sprints before I'd even run a Monte Carlo, say this is where I think we could get in the backlog by a certain period of time, if that's what we need. There is this fallacy that dates don't exist inside of Scrum. Dates exist. They, if you're building a product that helps support something for the Super Bowl in a normal year, not a COVID year, we'll see what happens this year, but the Super Bowl is happening on a date and it's going to happen, right? Um, so you have to have your stuff ready or it's not gonna be there. And so you can do forecasts, um, but I think if you're ever gonna give a date, you need to also give a confidence interval. The great thing about a Monte Carlo is that it takes your empirical data from the past of when did you get work done and how long did it take you? and says, now, how long is it gonna take you to do what's 
it's you know future looking into your backlog. And so that's a pretty good tool. Um, but when we're talking about tasks and big breakdowns up front, um, I guess I would steer away from that. You, those, that seems, sounds like a lot of guessing and a lot of analysis up front. And is there some kind of feedback we could get that where we could learn something faster and then and be able to make a better um, guess of when we're going to have whatever we want to go to market with if that's what we're trying to do. So I think trying to get away from being very precise in your estimates and try to be accurate and starting to get in the ballpark. So precise is like really tight cluster of arrows like maybe going together and accurate's like we're we're aligning around like we're getting close to the target and we might be all around but we're going to be somewhat close. So I think that's the focus when you're thinking about forecasting and estimates. Um, detail planning way out in the future is very very wasteful and so try to avoid that whenever you can. Great, thanks Jeff. Yeah, I always I always think back to one of my products that I worked on where uh, you know every every month we had a review and this was pre scrum. Um this was back uh, quite a long time ago, but every month we had a review and every month we were 18 months away. We weren't <laughs> using empirical data. We weren't using that that evidence. We weren't looking at short iterations to to deliver something and let's 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 learn. It was just you know we had this big goal and we just were charging toward that goal and we really had it, it, it took a, a while to figure out, all right, how are we really going to get here? And it mm -hmm. took that time of learning and, and empiricism to do that. So thank right. you. Yeah, um, and then updating that forecast regularly is really important too. I think you're kind of hitting on that where every sprint review, I'd be showing that forecast to everybody who wants to see it. Like it's changed this sprint because we've delivered this. It's changed because we've learned these new things in the market. And so that first time you show a Monte Carlo or some type of forecast, people might be shocked on the date and the conference intervals, but as you showed and they see how it changes over time, um, it becomes less of a contentious conversation and it's just data, it's not emotional. It's just, this is what the data tells us. And so um, there's another PST, Summer Lawrence, and she has this saying of uh, whenever there is emotion, just apply data and you know, that just, you apply math and then you know, data, emotion kind of goes away. So um, you can do that with these Monte Carlos. It's just, it's just information and data, empirical data that you're applying to the problem space. Yeah, the, the other thing I've found that, that really plays well in here are the Scrum values. It, it's mm -hmm. having the courage to, to step up and say, yeah, we're not, things are changing and we need to change these dates or, or, or really ha having that openness of, of, of talking about why we're seeing change and why we may need to change things and, and the like. And, and what I've seen in, in a lot of traditional thinking, non-agile thinking especially, is that that courage goes away. And and, and that, well, we're, we were told we need to go and hit that date, so we just have to go, need, go and hit that date. And then when we get close to it, we'll figure out what, what to do then, um, rather than really kind of hitting it head on. Right. So um, next question, this, this is a good one. Um, I'm a new Scrum Master and, and I'm hopefully gonna start working on my first team shortly. Um, what advice do you have, Jeff, for, for a new Scrum Master? Just getting started, what should they look out for? What should they uh, be aware of? What kind of challenges and, and things should they maybe try to do? Yeah, I think I was gonna give you one resource to read. It'd be the eight misunderstood and uh, preferred stances of a product owner or of a scrum master that uh, we have out there from um, Barry and Christian. It's on the scrum.org website. That's a great place to start because you're gonna have some perceptions out there of what a scrum master should be doing and what you sh and then what we would say a scrum master should be doing because the industry tends to put the scrum master in a very team focused role very administrative type of role and that's not your intent so i would say read that that's the first step and then um really put it to the team like your job is to facilitate ask the team you're not the problem solver don't be a problem solver your job is to reveal the system to the system a lot of times and um you know take it incrementally you don't have to know everything it's a very there's a very broad space continue to learn i'd say continuously improve um, there's so many good resources out there um, to learn from. And um, I guess, you know, remember that the th main reason why Scrum works so well, the plate that like everything else sits on is that done working increment. And so make sure your team's getting that done working product 
um, every single sprint. And by done, we mean potentially releasable. And when you have that, it opens up the opportunity for learning um, and inspection, and then allows you to adapt and gives you the opportunity to make that very transparent of what you've actually done. So if you can remember to always get there, um, and if you're not there yet, if you're struggling with that, that's the number one thing to focus on. There's really nothing more important than getting to done if you if you can't get to done. So those would be the things that I would I would say you know uh, here's what here's what I would do to get started, and um, and then you know be prepared to change change as the world changes around you because you're gonna have to have to. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. And yeah, I'd add you know build the trust of that team. Build the confidence of, of that team, and 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 that'll go a long, long way. So, uh, kind of going to a bit more of an advanced question. So, I'm a scrum master for for two different teams, and they're very, very different. Um, do you have any suggestions, thoughts on on how do I allocate my time across those teams mm -hmm. to make sure that we're we're delivering value? Yeah. Um, so. Remember the three three areas that a Scrum Master serves, right? They serve the development team, they serve the product owner, and they serve the organization. So depending on where your teams are at, they might get to more of a self-sustaining pace where they don't need as much of you. And that's great, that's awesome. You've done your job, you're doing your job as a Scrum Master if you're enabling that team to take a lot more ownership. And, um, and then you can move on to working with the product owner and the bigger things that are getting in, in your way as an organization from being more agile. Maybe you can spend more time with that other team. So I would say you have to take it everything in context. Um, and um, and don't, don't think of yourself just as the team scrum master. Like there's much more to being a scrum master than, than just working with, you know, the team, the scrum team. Great. Thanks, Jeff. So um, a little around metrics. Do, do you have any suggestions, thoughts, ideas around metrics to measure productivity, quality, and improvements in using yep. Scrum? <laughs> I do. Um, so there's different types of metrics. Actually, I'm going to just draw something here again. So there is activity, base metrics. Oh, let me get my zoom right here. So in activity-based metrics, or there's things that we do, right? Um, there's hours that we work, there's tasks that I get done that lead to some type of output. This sometimes we call velocity or you know throughput or something along those lines or cycle time. Those things lead to outcomes. Those outcomes are generally customer related. Maybe it's number of users, maybe it's feature usage rate. Um, Maybe it's um, some other customer type metric, some something that they do. Then there's impacts. So impacts are more along the lines of business related outcomes. So like ROI, revenue, cost savings, things along those lines, depending on your context. And so what happens a lot of times is people focus on this output and not on maybe even activity, and they forget the outcomes and the impacts. And so I would say when you're thinking about a team, don't forget about the outcomes that we're looking for and how you're aligning around those. Um, those velocity metrics, those hours, those tasks, this can be like gauges on like your, if you've ever seen a you know a commercial airline, like they've got all these gauges up in the front. Those could be gauges that you could look and say, oh, do we have a problem here? We may have a problem and you could dig into them, but that's for the team to dig into and figure out. Um, the outcomes and impacts are like how we're actually where we're going on our flight and are we, you know, are we are we meeting the objectives of getting there at a certain time and and uh, safely and all those all those good things. So I would look into evidence based management. So there's four key value areas inside of that um, current value, which is like the current value of your current product. Um, unrealized value, which is like the unrealized value within the market. And then those are the kind of the more. Um, product focused metrics. And then there's like more of the technical focused metrics or the enabling type of uh, metrics that are underneath it in the two other categories of key value areas, which are your time to market. So we might be looking at things like cycle times. We might look at mean time to repair, um, things along those like defects, right? That all could be part of that. Uh, oh, the defects might be more in the in innovation rate, which is the, the fourth key value area 
or we might be looking at um, you know how much time are we spending context switching we might be looking at how much time are we working on new features versus bugs and maintenance and other things along those lines so you can find there's different there's a lot of examples we have a EBM guide out there on scrum.org and you can look at there's so many different metrics you can use but what's important is that you have these four areas they're balanced and you align on where you're going from a product standpoint what's valuable over the next few sprints for us to focus on is it unrealized value are we trying to capture market share are we trying to enable more capacity to innovate so are we trying to open up and pay off some technical debt and get rid of some of this maintenance so that we can build out new features and build out that current value and 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 capture the unrealized value those are all decisions that um, we want to make holistically and we want to be thinking about the effects on on each of the metrics on the other metrics and so uh, I would just or, I mean we have a whole workshop we've got a whole guide on this it's a it's a very hot topic um, and so I, I that's where I'd encourage you to go look um, for more details cool thanks uh, Jeff and I, I actually threw the link out into uh into the chat so everyone has a link to where the evidence-based management information is if, if you can't find it if you just go to scrum.org slash ebm uh, you should see it there as well so the next question uh, how can we encourage a client to take on more of the product owner responsibilities when they don't work in an agile way yet we do um, you know, this, this is always a, a, a tough one when you're when you're the contractor and, and you're working for a client and, and you they need to have that input. They they really are the ones that, at the end of the day, are receiving that value. Um, some thoughts there? Um, I think I would show them the cost, right? Like if they're not involved, similar to the story I told a little earlier, like there's a cost to them not being involved. You're going to build out in a direction that maybe doesn't align to where they where they want to go or where they see. Um, and so what I would encourage them to do is um, if the increments we're providing every sprint are aligned to your vision and where we're going and delivering the value you would expect, right? You're probably spending the right amount of time with the team that's developing the work. If you're, if, if they're not and they're starting to deviate, then maybe you need to spend a little bit more time articulating, you know, what your vision is, what's the outcomes we're trying to achieve. Um, what does success look like, you know? And if you, and if you can do that, um, then hopefully those increments, those that done working product that you're providing, starts to align more to that vision of what the client um, actually has. But I, I think you know most clients aren't going to want to hear, well, we need a product owner because Scrum says so, especially if they're if they're waterfall and very traditional. But they but what will what will speak to them is value. Like you're going to be spending, you're going to be wasting a lot of money if you don't if you're not involved with us. Uh, we're going to build stuff you don't need, which is going to cost you more money. We're not going to provide you the value you need if you don't, if you're not there. We're going to increase risk of this being, you know, a failure if you're not a part of it. I think if you talk to those types of things, they're they're going to care a lot more about that because they care about that um, from a business standpoint, from a you know pr product success standpoint. So those would be the things that I'd urge you to do and um, stay away from. Um, especially if you have an uh, organization that's very traditional, like stay away from using Scrum terms when you're talking with them. Talk about the value of the things that we do, right? What's the value of a product owner? What's the value of alignment? What's the value of having those decisions made quickly? Um, talk to that value when you're talking to them, and I think they'll they'll get that. Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, so next, what what's the best way to resolve team conflict? Or do you have suggestions around? There's probably no best way, right? But what are what are some of the ways that that you go about as a scrum master to, in in resolving that that team conflict? Sure. So I think you know psychological safety, trust. Those are things that um, it's like a bank account or a piggy bank, and you need to make deposits to add trust and psychological safety. And sometimes you may, you know, unknowingly be making withdrawals. And so it's not something you can say, oh, wow, we have a problem. We need to build this up right now. I mean, you can, but like it's probably too late at that point. You probably are overdrawn in that bank account, that emotional bank account that people have and that trust. So um, if you do have that trust and psychological safety, having conflict should be very easy. People understand that it's it's not personal. Like we can disagree. We can have passionate debate and we should have passionate debate. But you know what? It doesn't, it's not like I'm saying your code is bad and you're bad. Like that's not what we're what we're after. So I would encourage if you're if you're struggling with conflict, start with building trust. Start with building that rapport. 
um, with teams, um, help people to get to know each other better, help people to build on that safety of it's okay to disagree. And um, there's some different activities you can run. I mean, I've done, uh, I'll give you one that I recently did like last week with a team where we needed to, we needed to make a deposit into that, that building trust um, bank account. And so what we did in, in a retro was um, had everybody go ahead and write down what's the one behavior that each person um, on the team has that benefits the team the most. And then what is the one behavior that um, you know hurts the team the most that each team member has? And they had to think of something for everyone. And don't let people like tell you, oh, I can't think of anything that any behavior that doesn't help the team. Uh, there's something. If you've worked with anybody for a while, there's something, right? Um, so I think as a scrum master, you have to like encourage them. There's a safe place to share this. And then you go through and you just say, okay, Eric, like everyone's going to read off their feedback, you know, you know, way behavior you help and the behavior that you know hurts the team, and you just hear it and you don't respond to it, and then you can start thinking personally, like, okay, how do I how do I improve? And this sounds very scary to a lot of teams when I propose this idea, um, especially if there's not a lot of trust, but people don't remember the negative as much. They remember the positives and usually people feel very warm and connected after doing an activity like that. So that's just one example of like, once I've built that trust and I know that I'm appreciated by my teams, it's a little easier to say, we're gonna have some conflict and we're gonna have some healthy debate. Awesome, thanks. Um, kind of, here's an interesting question. I, 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 think, I think there's some good value that can come out of this and it ties back to some of the conversations that you've already been having, Jeff. Um, how, how, how do we handle when I've got one development team, many stakeholders and, and many customers? Are, are there suggestions on how to handle that? Yeah, I mean, all stakeholders aren't created equal, right? There's some that are really crucial. There's some that maybe we just need to inform. And I think some product owners, they find it really valuable to kind of map that out. Like who, you know, Who's my ones that I need to like keep very, very close? Who are the ones that I just need to keep informed? And maybe here are the ones I just need to keep satisfied. And how do I treat them appropriately, hear what they have to say, and then make decisions off of that? So I totally get like, it, you're not an order taker as a product owner. You need to be empowered to make decisions. You need to have the authority to make decisions. Um, there's this um, concept that we have of different types of product owners. And the question kind of makes me think like maybe we're in a we're in a different spot here as a product owner where maybe we're more of an order taker instead of an order maker. I'm talking about ordering decisions like in a backlog. So what might be happening if I draw this little chart here? There, you, there's different kinds of product owners. There's the proxy product owner that just oh, actually sorry I did that wrong. There's the scribe first. Um, and you know they provide value to the organization. They maybe enter a lot of things in the tool. They write down user stories. They get gather requirements, um, but they probably don't make a lot of ordering decisions. And then you've got the the proxy, which is next, which is where I was going. Um, and they maybe go off to stakeholder, you know, sponsor over here and say, you know, should we move this button on the right side of the page or the left side of the page? Should we do it this way or should we do it that way? How do we do this calculation, right? So they're a proxy. Then you got the next level product owner, which is more that business rep. They understand the business. They can make certain make ordering decisions. They're they maybe don't have a view into like financials, PL, things like that. Or maybe they do, but they don't have a lot of control. And then you have the sponsor level. Sir, oh, sorry, I'm getting really messy here. Um, that's up here and they're a little higher. So they're, they're more responsible for the P&L, um, getting budget, um, the outcomes, the ROI, those types of things. And then your last, your most, your best love is your entrepreneur. Um, and the entrepreneur level is more like, hey, you have a vested stake. There's outcomes that happen for me personally. If there's success, there's, um, and you can have this entrepreneurial mindset. You don't actually have to be the one person that started this company but you definitely have a view into the financials, to the ROI, to the outcomes into the industry um, of what you're providing when you're on that sponsor area. So the areas up here are, um, these are your order makers and the people down here are more your order takers. 
And I would encourage you to try to work your way to the right. And if you're over on the left, that's okay. Um, but take that next step. And part of that is knowing your stakeholders and getting involved in the different meetings and figuring out the full context and not just saying, you know, yes, I'll do exactly what you said. Um, so I would encourage anybody who's in that product owner role where you are, you know, more just, you are just taking orders from people. You know, you're that, you're that, you know, that short order cook that's kind of just taking orders from a customer or from a stakeholder, like push yourself a little further to the right and really understand the business more, understand the needs and um, try to take more of a holistic approach and get to get to that sponsor entrepreneurial level. You know, any other questions, Eric, yeah. or follow up on that? We, we've got lots of, lots <laughs> of other questions here. Jeff. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, We've talked a little bit about this, but how, how do you scale the product owner? They talked about one product, one product owner, but how do you scale it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we were talking before, right up here, like we want to scale like, like this, one product owner, multiple teams. Um, and a lot of people are like, well, how do you actually do that? And um, I, I, first off, think of your product owner like a CEO. So your product owner is the CEO for that product. Now, you have one CEO, whether you have a, a, a startup with five people or 5,000 or 50,000 people that work for, for your company. And so you still have one CEO. We have one product owner. But that CEO does very different things depending if there's five people in the company or 50,000 people in the company, right? Like we wouldn't want Jeff Bezos going down to... Um, you know, a distribution center and saying this and putting, you know, labels on a, on a package, like that would be bad or moving packages around on a semi, like we wouldn't want a CEO involved in any of that. Um, and a product owner that's scaling would have to delegate just like that CEO would do, like Jeff Bezos does, right? Because there's certain things he's not going to do that maybe he would have did if they were just a five person company. And so I would say, figure out what you can delegate and what you can't delegate. Um, there's this thing called delegation poker. It's a, a activity from management 3.0. Um, I use it a lot with teams when we start to add more teams and we have to figure out what the product owner is going to do and what they're not going to do and what we're going to empower people to do on the development teams. So there's some things that the product owner might have done when there was just one team that we're going to push down to the development team and we need to build those skills up or add a person that can help us some of those skills, but they're on the teams helping to do that work. And so I think that's, um, I guess that's where I would I would push um, organizations to go. Don't just create a bunch of product owners and put a product owner on each team. Um, it's really skill sets we're looking for. Like, do we have analysis skill sets on our teams? Do we have project management skill sets on our teams? A lot of people don't like to talk about that. Like, where where what happens to them? But we need those skills on a team. And a product owner is, as you add more and more teams, is going to do very little of that. Um, they're going to do a lot more. Um, you know, product management, they're going to do more marketing, they're going to do more leadership type stuff, they're going to be setting outcomes and objectives, um, they're going to be setting the vision, they're going to make, be making sure that we have some way to validate that, that value is being delivered. Those are all the things that a product owner is going to probably keep. Um, and and they maybe they're just informed in some of it instead of actually doing it um, as they have more and more teams. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah. Kind of the opposite side of that, I guess. Um, we're a startup, and do um, you have suggestions on on Scrum for startups and, and things that that maybe they should look out for? Um, you know, small teams, small companies. Of course, if Scrum recommends you know, to be used uh, by teams of, of of three to nine, give or take, people. So I think it's the perfect place. For that to improve that communication and so on but yeah do you have suggestions thoughts around using scrum in a startup yeah so this isn't just because you're small that i'm suggesting this but um also maybe because you don't have product market fit yet and you haven't you haven't got to a market where you've said yep this is exactly what we need to do so what i would what i would encourage you to do is look at the truth curve which is um, a concept from gift constable um that's out there and basically there's the whole idea behind the truth curve is we want to validate as cheaply as we can that we're going down the right path. And so there might be things that you do like, maybe we do some paper prototyping, maybe we do interviews with um, users. 
Um, maybe as we're building stuff out, we do like a Wizard of Oz where it doesn't fully work like all automated like we want it to in the future, but we're proving that someone's actually gonna buy the product before we automate a bunch of stuff. And so there might be some manual tasks, but then you gotta go back and automate that later if you find that there is that's happening. You might have buttons in the nowhere, right? Like um, I click this button and it says feature coming soon. Maybe you track how many people track that or click that button and you know that would be really valuable for, for users. So I'll tell a quick little story. There was a uh, team I was working with and um, there was this this idea that we wanted to build this thing out to integrate with all these different um, application systems as people filled out and did their loans. And uh, it was gonna cost many millions of dollars to, to build this integration out with all these different um, companies we were working with. Um, but what we did is we put a button out there. It took us a couple hours and said, you know, fill out your loan now. And nobody clicked on it, like no one. And so we saved millions of dollars by not building out that that big, big feature because we learned nobody cared about that. No one was gonna do that. And so those would be the things I'd encourage you to do as a startup is like, make sure you're spending your time and your, um, you know, your resources in, in the right areas and improve out experiments um, as cheaply as you possibly can to figure out where your niche is and don't be afraid to pivot. Um, so maybe even tracking, you know, what experiments you're running, having hypothesis, you know, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and what are the facts that you actually have learned would be another good tool to, to use as you're kind of trying to figure that out. Um, and you could, it doesn't just have to be startups, it could be really any new product, and it could be a large organization too that you could apply these principles. Um, but especially when you're trying to, you know, find that product market fit, these are great things to look into. Awesome, thanks Jeff. Um, and, uh, back to product owner, uh, as a product owner, should I plan for future sprints to make it easy to prepare uh and how far in advance or how far out should we be looking what's our focus sure yeah it it matters it depends so i'll give that you know traditional consultant answer it depends um on your context right and it depends on the trust you have in the organization it depends on um where you are in the organization um like how much authority and that you have but just understand the risk so if i've got a product backlog here and um, I want my very detailed things on the top, and I want some little little bigger things maybe in the middle, and I want some very, very big things probably on the bottom. What I can tell you is that when you do very detailed all the way down, you'll throw a lot of that away because it won't be relevant when you get there. I can't tell you how many times I've seen teams do this, where they come in, someone's gotten excited, and they spent you know, months maybe building out this backlog very granularly and we get a couple sprints in and we end up throwing big, big pieces of it away. A lot of waste going on there. So what is that magic number? I can't tell you what exactly it's gonna be, but I can tell you that it ranges usually between two to four sprints, usually I would say most cases of pretty detailed stuff. Maybe you can go less if, if you're, a lot of things are emerging and things are changing very quickly but I would track how much stuff you're actually throwing away and how often things change. And if things aren't changing that often, then you're probably in a good spot if you feel like you're keeping up at a consistent pace. If you feel like things are changing, you're throwing a lot away, then maybe you should do less detailed plans. If you feel like, you know, um, you just can't, you, you never have everything ready for the team. They're always getting ahead of you. Then maybe you need a little bit more, a mo little bit more, um, or maybe the team needs to be involved that are um, as you go forward. So. I think that the, it depends is, is the, the short answer, but um, you kind of have to feel that out and find the right rhythm. But I'd say most teams definitely find their, find that they go too detailed and go too far. So that's the tendency of most teams. So be careful of that. Hey, Jeff, there, there was a quick question. You had mentioned the book, The Eight Things. Can you, uh, I think it, it kind of, went through quickly. Can you can you name the title of that book again? Um, can you give me a little more context? What was the, I don't remember um, saying it was, it, oh, it was, it was in, um, you were talking about the Scrum Master and the, the oh, a new Scrum yes. Master and one of the things that they should focus on. Yeah, um, so it's from the Liberators. It's the eight misunderstood stances and the eight preferred stances of a Scrum Master. Um, and so there's a, we have like a, a long article on Scrum on our, in our resources section in scrum.org that um, talks through that. Um, so there, yeah, that. 
there, there's there's a white paper. There's some blogs. Yep. If you just if you just uh, go on the Scrum.org Resource Center and look at eight and look at stances or eight stances, you'll you'll find some some blogs, some articles, um, and, and some white papers. Cool. I, yeah, I didn't pick that up, and a couple other folks didn't either. That's perfect. Thank you. So I, I think we probably have time for for one more one or two more questions. Um, there there are a lot of questions in here around uh, around culture and just kind of how to deal with um, I'm kind of summarizing because there, there were a bunch of them H how do you deal with, with people and, and a lot of this is coming in from I think distributed teams H how do you, how do you get distributed teams who have cultural differences kind of working together any any thoughts around that hmm. that might be too big of a question to, to open up with only a few minutes left too but um, you know, I think it starts with empathy and understanding are good places to start. Um, so I'll give you one technique that I've used with teams. And I've used this for scrum teams that a lot of times are blaming managers or other leaders because they, they seem to paint them as a, as a bad guy. Um, but you could use it in your team as well. And a lot of times we use this um, with customers. It's just an empathy map. And when you go through an empathy map, there's these different steps. And it's like, well, what are the things that matter to this person? And and you kind of like paint this picture and tell the story to yourself as you walk through this empathy map and you kind of go through each of the steps. And when you do that, what I'd encourage you to do is do that maybe individually for a certain person or if there's conflict somewhere and then share that with that person and have that conversation with them and, you know, have some courage, live the scrum values. Um, to have that courage to, to have that tough conversation. This is the story I'm telling myself, you know, what's actually happening here. And um, I think you'll get to clarity and you'll, you'll have a much better understanding of each other walking through that exercise together. That could be one way to get started. Great. So um, I want to be conscious of time in our, our time box here. Um, so I want to just thank everybody for joining today. Thank everybody for their time. Jeff, I want to thank you as well for your time and in, in the effort that you've put forth. Um, and like I said earlier, Jeff, we'll be uh, looking at the questions that we didn't get to because there were a lot of them uh, and, and getting back to you via email and, and hopefully answering your questions the best he can. Uh, with that, I'll just say thank you very much for your time and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff.